So I would like to uh, recognize my co-authors on here. As you'll see as I go through this, this has been a very big project, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about a little bit of it. Uh, Shagor Biswas is, uh, was a PhD student on this, so he actually deserves uh, most of the credit for getting this talk together. In uh, 2007, uh, EPA had a call for proposals to look at the fate of hormones and CAFOs, and you can see on the screen uh, a number of institutions that got funded. Uh, I think they were st called STAR grants. Our work was just with beef cattle manure, but within the whole context of the United States, they've worked with these other species. About 96% of the CAFO cat, uh, CAFOs implant their cattle. I am a soil scientist, a nutrient management person, uh, so you know the, the audience here may be a more animal science than uh, nutrient management, so you would probably know more about these implants than I do. But they are used extensively, and there is a big concern uh, about these materials getting into the water and then affecting uh, aquatic life and then also humans. And I'm not going to go into any of those effects, but just to say the, that they are a big concern in the general public, and that's why this was funded. As Also, the animal industries, certainly in Nebraska, and I would imagine through the rest of the uh, cattle area, is very concerned about the public uh, perception of these uh, steroids getting into the water. So we don't really have an extension program related to our results yet uh, because uh, because of the sensitivity of it. Uh, as you'll see, we didn't find a lot of movement, so it probably isn't quite, the cattle industry in Nebraska isn't quite as nervous about this study as they were in 2007 when we started it. There are a lot of uh, chemicals that one needs to search for. Uh, Dan Snow is our organic chemist, and uh, he did all the analyses our publications have all the methodology, which uh, I was really happy when I was in, uh, an undergraduate, when I got a B in organic chemistry. My average was about 55, so I thought I was failing, but uh, I am not a, a chemist. So the, the take home message on this slide is that there are natural uh, variants of these chemicals as well as the synthetic ones. And you can see the trimbalone and the xerol and the MGA there at the bottom are ones that would be given to the animals. And there are a lot of metabolites as well from these chemicals. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to uh, track them as you go through the process of uh, manure leaving the animal. In addition to the, the materials that the animal could produce and that the managers can give, uh, there are natural occurring analogs of some of these chemicals and where you have uh, fusarium growing on corn or on other uh, plant materials that can contaminate and add to the uh, complexity of figuring out what actual management is doing uh, and the effect on the quantities of these in the environment. So it, it's kind of hard to separate out. The implants are used uh, because they produce some good as we heard uh, from uh, Dr. Kelsch this morning, uh, the concern to you know feed the human population inexpensively is improved by the use of the implants. Uh, you can get more meat uh, from less grain, and you also get leaner meat usually, uh, so that may be healthier. So there's a lot of benefits to the use of these, even though there are potentially some environmental negatives. So our project was fairly large, uh, and I'm not going to go through all our objectives, uh, but what I'm going to try to focus on is the handling of the manure. Essentially, that would have been either we composted it or stockpiled it, and then following the land application uh, and some simulated rainfall. And I'm going to start off with how we produce the manure, even though that isn't the main uh, focus of what I want to talk about. If you think through the where the manure and where the hormones that are fed to the, the cattle are put in the implants, 
they can um, end up in a lot of places. And I haven't uh, put on here going into the air, so we're just looking at uh, stuff going through uh, onto the land or into our water. And so there are a lot of paths which uh, these materials can go through and have some degradation. We're, our focus here is on the uh, overland runoff, which could get into streams or lakes. Uh, we did do some work on Vada zone and movement down. I'm not going to present any of that information. And we have a little work on plant uptake. Uh, again, I don't have time to present that. We haven't even finished uh, analyzing all the plant material there. So at the Haskell Ag Lab where I work, which is in northeast Nebraska, we have a little feedlot. And so we were using heifers. We had six pens, three with implants, three without. Uh, we collected surface samples of the manure uh, and urine patches uh, three times during the, the study. And then when there was a natural rainfall event, we collected uh, the runoff with a kind of a tipping bucket collection point here. And we then scraped the, these little pens and used the manure to either stockpile or compost it. And we did that two years in a row. We really didn't, we do have data on some of the uh, steroids that were in the feces and in the urine. I'm not going to present that except to say that we did find DTEX in 80% uh, of the treated and control samples. Uh, we didn't find any of the synthetic steroids in our uh, non-treated areas. But there was a lot of variation and we weren't able to, we didn't have enough data to track a specific one of those 17 chemicals. Uh, there was apparently a lot of degradation in the feedlot during the season. So again, uh, we, we created this manure, and then we're moving it to a stockpile or to a compost, and then we're going to land apply it. Uh, and so from that point, we collected the manure, put it in the, underneath uh, a covered silage pit, really, and created both the stockpile and the uh, compost. Now, how well this was composted, uh, I don't know if there was a tremendous difference. I don't have the analysis of the carbon, uh, but we tried to do uh, as best we can uh, with the material to, to turn the uh, compost and create a difference between the two. Uh, in the manure that we collected, uh, you see there it's April 2008. So this would be the analysis of the manure after it's been through the winter period. There is a little bit of evidence here that we um, had some degradation. The C here is uh, compost untreated, compost treated versus the stockpile untreated and treated. Uh, where you see those red circles, they're a little bit higher than um, the compost. So there may have been some degradation. We didn't really, in this part of the study, uh, you know, randomize, replicate it, so it's not one that we would uh, have statistics with. But if you look at the, on the right there, if you look at the total concentration, there is uh, some tendency to have less of the steroids where we composted the material. So uh, I think other literature has shown similar things. Okay, so we have the manure, we produce the manure, and then uh, what our plan was to simulate rainfall by using an irrigation system, and we have essentially a factorial experiment of composted and stockpiled manure that was produced treated and untreated, and then we have uh, three different tillages. So the Haskell Ag Lab is a half section in size, there's a feedlot on the southeast corner. And then uh, we have some ground to the north that had been in long-term no-till. We uh, kept it free of plant material in, in order to uh, do the study. So it's a little bit hard to see, but in the up here, this is an aerial photograph. You can see where some of the tillage uh, had already been applied. We normally get about 26 inches of rainfall. Uh, between the study, we don't have, we didn't have much rain 
between the first day and the 30 days, so all the water was pretty much what we applied. Uh, we applied a large amount of manure, really, uh, because we use the availability factor in the organic part as about 0.15. Uh, we were trying to get about 170 pounds of available in. Uh, not that we were growing crops, but we wanted to have, uh, you know, a typical load of manure that a producer may put on as compared to just putting 60 tons or something or 120 without any rational reason. And the quantity of manure certainly is going to affect uh, the runoff. We used a 25-year storm, which in our area was 75 millimeters per hour. And what we did was we irrigated until we got runoff, and then we collected runoff at every five minutes uh, for six samples. So essentially, we collected the first half an hour of samples. Uh, those of you who have done some work uh, with phosphorus can, would recognize these tents. They're uh, what they used to do some of the work for the, that was the basis for the phosphorus index and some runoff. The tarps are to keep the wind out and the water in. There was one nozzle on the top that uh, sprayed uniformly. We had these metal uh, containers around a smaller area in the tent, and then the water would run off into the pipe there, and oh, they would time how, when water started coming out of the tube, they would fill a jar, time how much, how long it took to fill a known volume, and then they, we could uh, do the math to figure out the flow rates, and we kept the samples frozen until they could be analyzed. In 2008, uh, just start off and say we didn't have a lot of material that we found in the runoff, partly because if you follow it through that schematic, there wasn't a lot in the manure when we collected it, and then there was even less after we uh, had it stockpiled and composted. So uh, for this talk, uh, I kind of want to focus more on the, uh, the tillage effects and what it might mean in terms of, uh, I don't know if rules are the right wor word, but interpreting what might be done in the future. Uh, so here we have the time to run off in minutes. And what was intriguing to me, and there was some talks this morning that indicated uh, they found similar things, but there was an interaction of sorts between the moldboard plow and the no-till uh, based on whether we did it right away after tillage versus the 30 days after tillage. And uh, you know, there's an effect of the immediate tillage might have helped the infiltration, but uh, over time uh, it might have settled. So uh, the lower the bar here means that runoff was quicker. We would hope that we'd have more infiltration in the no-till, but it seemed that in the first uh, sampling after one day, the tillage didn't really affect. Uh, there was no difference between the tillage treatments. It started to show up uh, after 30 days. So uh, just like on frozen ground, as was discussed this morning, the time of the rainfall and the spreading would have a big effect uh, on how much hormones might run off, because if the water goes into the soil, we won't have runoff of hormones. Uh, in terms of the manure treatments, the compost over here compared to the stockpile, there's a little evidence that maybe the compost, there might have been more organic material in there, uh, it's less decomposed, more resilient. Uh, it was a little bit longer until they had runoff compared to the stockpiled manure, and I would suppose maybe fresh manure, which we didn't put on there, might be lower here yet. One other way to look at the, uh, the effect of the simulated rainfall would be how many millimeters of uh, rainfall was in the runoff over that 30-minute period. And it, it sort of follows the, uh, the time to run off. If you, if you look at the disk, the moldboard plow, and the no-till, there is that uh, interaction here where the no-till did better 30 days after, uh, after treatment compared to the one day, especially relative to the moldboard plow, which did pretty good right away, but then it started to consolidate and uh, not do as well later on. 
the frequency of detection of the steroids uh, also had, I don't have a legend here, but the clear bar is the, yeah, it is right there. Uh, it, we had more uh, 30 days later by tillage uh, for the ones where we dissed, and that might have something to do with the sorption characteristics. It was tightly held, maybe, and of course, right away, this was uh, incorporated. One of the problems that we do have with this data is uh, if we look at the untreated uh, samples, these would be our controls. Uh, there was, at least after 30 days, uh, a fair amount of detects in the untreated, so this would uh, have to be the natural hormones that would come from the animals. And uh, so that was actually more here than the treated, and it would take a little bit of time to try to explain that. Okay, so because in 2008 we had very few detects, we decided in 2009 to actually add a known chemical to ensure sufficient concentrations uh, so we would have, so we could collect something uh, and see the effect of those uh, management treatments. So we used a chemical that was not used in beef cattle feeding. It's not released by cattle, so we would know that what we put there was what was there from our uh, human activity as compared to something that might occur naturally. There's certainly uh, lots of ways animals would get on these plots, deer, other things that would maybe release the chemical. So we use this chemical in front of you. We call it EE2. And we applied it uh, in a smaller study than the first study. We looked at just tillage and no tillage. We put on about the same amount of manure the second year. We used the treated manure from that second feeding study, and we put on uh, 7.5 milligrams per meter squared, which is much higher rate than what you would expect if you were producing these in the animal. So uh, certainly one of the artifacts of the experiment here is that we over-applied this chemical uh, so that we could find it uh, when we did our rainfall simulation. So there were three reps there. Simplifying the results, again, we looked at the time to runoff initiation because for me, you know, that would be real important in terms of an actual storm. The, the more we can keep going into the soil, the uh, less likelihood it would be uh, you know, to run off. Uh, statistically, there really wasn't any difference between these two numbers, uh, but there was, uh, depending on, you know, how uh, severe you are uh, as a statistician, uh, point one, uh, tillage effect of the total precipitation, and that would be the millimeters of rain uh, to runoff plus the 30, uh, 30 minutes of rain after that. And here, the tillage, there was more uh, rainfall than with the uh, no-till. So even though it took longer to uh, get the tillage to start, uh, we ended up putting on more water here than here. Uh, and so that means that, you know, right away, one, this is one day after application. So the first day application, the no-till um, had 100 millimeters versus the 133 for the tillage. We did not do the 30-day, and that would have been uh, something we should have done to see if there was that interaction the second year. It, it all comes down to this slide, and I've simplified and left out uh, some of the treatments. The Putting the EE2 on the soil is just kind of an artifact of something you do to balance your experiment, uh, but you would not never be doing that in real life, uh, putting it on bare soil. So essentially, we're looking at the tillage uh, with the manure, and uh, the flow weight of concentration is uh, over... It, that would be in uh, weight per liter. What's really important here is the amount of the surrogate that was lost over that 30-minute time. And here the statistics are pretty clear. It, it, is, it does make sense if you're going to disk in the uh, manure, you're going to cover up uh, the surrogate, and so you get the uh, lack of runoff. So to kind of summarize everything here, if we follow through that schematic that I showed and been showing through the talk, we really didn't find a lot of steroids uh, 
in the feedlot after the feeding period, which was about 145 days. There was a lot of natural degradation, uh, sunlight, things like that. Uh, we did see minor benefit from composting the feedlot manure. There was a reduction in some of the, uh, the uh, steroid. And then the runoff from the fields were affected by our tillage and also the timing of the rain, which uh, makes it difficult to say that uh, doing this or that would be uh, better. But it seemed like if we get rain right after uh, tillage, it's not as bad as if we waited uh, 30 days. And it would be better to have uh, maybe a 60 and 90 day simulation to get a better handle on everything. Uh, and then. I didn't show the data, but uh, the absorption characteristics of these chemicals meant that we didn't get uh, very much leaching where we had our lysimeter studies. We, I don't have that data to show you uh, today because of time, uh, but we were able to pick it up in the soil when we tested soil uh, going down uh, below. Uh, I, I don't think it went down too far, but uh, there was more there where it was absorbed. The question was what the tillage was for the second study, and it was a discount. 